If you had to use three words to describe Jesus, would you use strange, dangerous, and divisive? Well, tonight on EWTN Live, we'll talk with one man who did and find out why. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Uh, before we get to tonight's guests, I want to mention that today is the Feast of St. Margaret of Scotland. She was born in 1045 A.D. and died in 1092. Not very long life, but enough time for her to become very holy. She married Malcolm III, who is the King of Scotland and used her influence as queen to support the cause of religion and piety, including the eventual regulation of the Lenten fast and the observance of the Easter communion. So she was canonized by Pope Innocent IV in 1250 AD. So we want to continue to pray for the church in Scotland, many of whom watch us, and God bless them and, and the growth of their church. Now. We have some guests tonight who've been spanning the world. They came only from Chicago, but they've been going all over the world to bring the heart of Catholicism to your television screen in an inspiring new documentary series meant to evangelize Catholics and Protestants alike. Simply titled Catholicism, it has already been picked up by PBS and it has prompted Chicago superstation WGN to launch a weekly half-hour television series called Word on Fire, hosted by the documentary's creator. So please welcome the creator of Catholicism series, Father Robert Barron, and the series director and editor, Mr. Matt Leonard. Father Barron, it's great to be on with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, you've completed this series. How many uh, parts of the series do you have, Father? We have 10 episodes, so we cover 10 of the major themes of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And I went around the world to find places and color and texture that would uh, exemplify these themes. So we have 10 episodes in total. Yeah, I, I've been watching this series, and you know, you start off in the Holy Land, you yeah. return there as, as is necessary for the theme, yeah. but you're also in Rome and India and yeah. Africa and other parts of Europe. Yeah. Uh, shots from Sweet Home Chicago. That's right. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's great we went to, to see. 16 countries, I think, and uh, I wanted to give that sense of the global texture of Catholicism because we're mm -hmm. a world religion. And I wanted that to come through, and I think it does. Each episode, I might go to four or five, six different locations. So as we're discussing God or Jesus or church or sacraments, you're getting a sense of this really global reality, which is the right. Catholic Church. Oh, no, that comes across in the video, yeah. in the video. And Matt, did you go to all these places yourself? I did. I was part of the crew. There were two places that we didn't go. We didn't go to the Philippines and uh, Brazil. We sent a camera crew out there, but everywhere else we were... We were there from as long as, th or as short as three days to two weeks, depending on how mm -hmm. much stuff we had to shoot there. Sure, um, sure. But yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. You know, one of the things that amazed me is how often you were able to get shots of very big, uh, uh, very busy uh, locations and shrines and tourist sites. Yeah. And you got shots with nobody in it, like you've got an opening scene from the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. You know, how did you get everybody cleared out? Well, we pulled some strings, you know. I guess, you, what do you know, the it, Pope? Well, yeah, I got some connections, you know. <laughs> oh, uh, I see. It, it was interesting, you know, we sometimes uh, would get into a place before the tourist, you know, hours were, so we'd film at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Other times, though, it was simply our crew taking the people and saying, folks, could you just hold on for a second? And we'd right. film 
quickly. Very often I'd be filming a stand up and there'd be all kinds of people standing around looking and pointing. And right. so we do it in different ways. I think as we moved on, we sort of learned the trick of filming before hours, after hours, maybe at lunchtime. I remember in the Orvieto Cathedral, we filmed in that beautiful section where the right. Signorelli uh, frescoes are. And the tour guide said to us, or the, the curator, you got 10 minutes. And so they opened the little gate, we went in, and I had to do this kind of elaborate stand-up talking about angels and devils all that, in 10 minutes, and then it was through. And then all the tourists came back in. So we sort of uh, scrambled, learned our way around, uh, sure. before hours, after hours. One of the places that really amazed me was how you got an empty Saint Chapelle. Yeah. You know, did you go to Quigley? I didn't, but oh, I know Quigley, of course, is modeled yeah, after Saint Chapelle. Yes, modeled yeah. after the, the chapel at yeah. Quigley North, Saint James Chapel. And uh, you know, Saint Chapelle is one of the treasures of oh, Europe. It's absolutely. one of the most beautiful places. Yeah, yeah. But it takes forever to get in there. Yes. There's big crowds and all, and you got it without a crowd. Yeah, and of course, I was a student in Paris for three years. I did my doctoral work there, so I knew Saint Chapelle well. But I had never gotten in except through the tourist line, where you come up the stairs right. and you wait for hours. No, we just got in before uh, the tourist hours. It was probably 6 a.m. Okay. We uh, filmed there. And then a great moment was after the stand-up, the cameraman said to me, Father, why don't you just go outside the doors? Because you never get in those main doors. Open the door and just enter the chapel. So I did, and we got this shot. And I said, right away, that's our money shot. That's the right. shot for the whole series. Right. Opening the door to this treasure house of Catholicism. So that was a great joy that day. Let me t show you a a little bit of a clip to give you an idea of how good the series looks. Uh, we'll take a look at one of the trailers. We don't realize how dangerous Jesus was. If he is who he says he is, then we have to give our whole life to him. If he's not who he says he is, he's not a good man. He's a dangerous, misguided fanatic. Jesus, more than any other figure, more than any other religious founder, compels us to make a choice. The church is meant to gather not just the people of the world. It's meant in some mystical way to gather all of creation, all of nature, around the energy of Christ. To be grounded in Christ, she realized, was to be grounded in that very power, which here and now creates the cosmos, that power which lies beyond the vagaries of space and time. The Christian faith is never meant to be held onto as a private privilege. It's meant to be shared. So the apostolic church to the present day still has that great missionary purpose. I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. You know, one, one of the things that uh, I'm aware of is that this is meant to be an evangelization tool for Catholics and Protestants alike, you know, because uh, one of the things I like about going through the videos mm -hmm. is that it's a compendium of the faith and you touch so many aspects of key doctrine, mm -hmm. but you do it not as a book but you do it on film and video. Yeah. yeah, that was my goal from the beginning, was to talk about the faith. We're a smart religion, we're a theologically sophisticated religion, but we're also beautiful. And I wanted to use that as an evangelical tool. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, are converted less by words and more by images. Um, I, I do a lot with the rose windows because I love uh, the Gothic churches. And the great Paul Claudel, you know, was converted by looking up at the North Rose window at Notre Dame. Um, that happens, think of, um, of Cardinal Lustiger, who was the Archbishop of Paris when I was a student. He was converted as a young man when he walked into one of the great cathedrals. So I take that very seriously to use beauty as a means of evangelization. And maybe someone is put off a bit by, you know, a too verbal approach, but they see something that's so splendid, it speaks of God, the source of beauty. And I wanted that to come through in this series. Well, it does. You know, you really 
use a lot of wonderful artwork. Uh, you, you go to places, you have Caravaggio, you have yeah. stained glass windows, you use the art in the churches yeah. to which you go. I mean, I recognize the artwork that you have all over the mm. Holy Land. You know, it, it's you know, marvelous imagery that you bring in. Yeah. And w you use that along with words so that the words and the images go together. It's incarnational, it's Catholic, you know, the word becomes flesh. And, and I argue that the incarnation is prolonged through space and time, precisely in the church, in the saints, in the liturgy, the sacraments, the Eucharist, the teaching of the church, is the prolongation of the incarnation. The mm -hmm. word keeps becoming flesh among mm -hmm. us. I wanted that to come through, I wanted the people mm -hmm. to see it. Uh, one of the great inspirations for this was um, Kenneth Clark's Civilization from the 1970s, that right. wonderful series, right. where he showed Western civilization. I thought, well, if he can do that with Western art, how much more with the Catholic faith? Because we're such a visual, sensual religion. Right. And I wanted that now to be part of the, uh, the real texture of the show. And I think, right. it, I think it, and it And it really comes across. When you were working on the crew, Matt, um, what did you find as some of the challenges in getting these images? Well, you know, we fortunately we had a, a brilliant uh, cinematographer, this guy John Cummings, who was just great. Uh, so he, you know, honestly, a lot of times it was just about, uh, you know, we're in this beautiful place. John just get a bunch of great looking shots, and uh, he did. He did. He did wonderful work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the whole crew did such a great job at at, at uh, organizing everything, at getting us in at good times. Mm -hmm. And as Father Barron said, you know, if we needed five minutes for people to, you know, stay out of the way, they were good at, you know, sort of at gently asking people, you know, could you mm -hmm. give us a give us a couple minutes. So um, the challenge for me, there wasn't much challenge for me because of the people I was surrounded with were, were so great. Oh, that's good. Well, man's being way too modest. I mean, you think <laughs> of all these programs, uh, every shot is a decision that, you know, he as the editor had right. to make to put these together in this kind of lyrical way. And they really do flow in this beautiful manner. And that's, you know, that's Matt's genius to have seen all that. Mm -hmm. And he's right about John Cummings. Uh, John was a, was a wonderful cameraman and often we would, film the stand-up, so we do you know, a, a film of me speaking, and then we'd say, John, go. And we're in Krakow, we're in Jerusalem, we're in Calcutta, we're in Mexico City, Rome, and John would just wander around that city and take in you know, the imagery and the color and the vitality. That's what you see coming through over and over right, again. Right, right. Now, one of the things that, um, uh, uh, besides the approach that you take that you know, invites people in mm -hmm. because of its beauty. There's also the importance of the content. You know, for instance, you begin by focusing on who Jesus yeah. Christ is. You ask right. that question. Uh, you also go into other key mm -hmm. uh, figures of the faith. You, you have a, a one video just on the Blessed Mother. Yeah. Uh, you deal with Peter and Paul. Yeah. And, you know, so what are some of the themes that you wanted to get across about our Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, and you're right that I wanted to start with Jesus. I, I think if, if Christian uh, theology gets off the ground in any other way, it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. You have to begin with Jesus Christ, and then you can connect everything to him. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, like, he's like a rose window. If he's in the center, the rest will fall into harmony. You start somewhere else, the project will become skewed. So mm -hmm. I wanted to begin with him. And you saw it a little bit in that uh, trailer. I wanted to begin with the distinctiveness of Jesus. Uh, my generation got an awful lot of the language of a domesticated Jesus, I would say. Mm -hmm. Jesus, who's like a lot of other religious teachers, like a lot of other gurus, I can find him inspiring and so on. But see, that's to miss Jesus because Jesus' novelty is that he spoke and acted in the person of God. You see, that's one of the things that you really bring out. Yeah. He is not like Muhammad, Moses, Buddha, yeah. or any of these other people. There yeah. is something radically different. That's right. How would you put that into words? Well, just that. I mean, I, and I say it to the, cre to the credit of the Buddha and Muhammad and so on. They're not drawing attention to themselves. I mean, Muhammad would say this revelation I received, I want you to know it, or the Buddha would say there's a path I found, I want you to walk it, I benefited from it, maybe you will too. The Buddha, in fact, drew attention away from himself in a certain way. Then there's Jesus. Now again, say what you want about him, whether you believe him or not, there's the claim of Jesus. The question is not, what do people think about my teaching? 
The question is, who do people say that I am? Mm -hmm. And that's because throughout the Gospels, he consistently says and does the things that only God could say and do. Therefore, you've got to make a choice about him. And I'm arguing there with C.S. Lewis and many others that um, Jesus compels a choice the way the other founders don't. Right. And again, I'm not putting the other founders down. They just don't compel the choice the way Jesus does because of the way he speaks and acts. And, and you will see, for instance, in Buddhism, that there is a devotion yeah. to the Buddha. Yeah. In Islam, yeah. there is an extraordinarily high respect mm -hmm. and love for Muhammad. Yeah. But in Christianity, it's something else. It is. And one of the clues, you know, is, as you well know, in the early church, the preoccupation with the ontology of Jesus. Who is he? What's his being? What we do you mean by ontology? The being of someone. What, what makes up the existence of someone? So we get up as Catholics every Sunday and we, we say, Jesus Christ, you know, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. We're making ontological claims about him, about his being. Where a Buddhist wouldn't fuss about the ontology of the Buddha. Right. A, a Muslim would not fuss about the ontology of Muhammad. No. Even granting all the respect and so on. And that tells you that something distinctive about Christianity. And it goes right back to Caesarea Philippi, to who do people say that I am, and to the way that Jesus distinctively spoke and acted, which compels this decision. As he himself said, either you're with me or you're against me. And that's why, because he makes you choose uh, how you stand vis-a-vis -vis him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the starting point of Christianity. Right. Uh, how do you stand vis-a-vis -vis Jesus? If he is who he says he is, as I say in that clip, then you have to give your life to him. If he's not who he says he is, he's actually a bad man. And that's right. C.S. Lewis's argument. Right. Uh, the old tradition had it out deus, out malus homo. Either he's God or he's a bad man. <laughs> and that's the choice that, uh, that he compels. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this is one of the things that when you do your video on the Blessed Virgin Mary, yeah. you also make it very clear that all the statements and yeah. the, the conciliar points that are made at Ephesus, which you do a nice shot at that yeah. church in Ephesus, where, where the, yeah. the doctrine of the Theotokos yeah. was defined. Yeah. Uh, you always make the point that the things said about Mary are really to go back to Jesus. Right. And I quote Fulton Sheen there, that uh, Mary's light is always reflected light, like the light of the moon. And see, you can look at the moon in some ways more easily. The sun is so bright you can't take it in, but the moon you can gaze at in a contemplative mm -hmm. way. So in a similar way, we can gaze at the Blessed Mother, but it's a reflected light right. from her sun. So all the claims that we make about her doctrinally are meant to be really Christological claims, finally. Statements about Jesus Christ. Yeah, to say that she's the mother of God, well, it's saying something extraordinary about her, but it's also witnessing to the incarnation that Jesus yeah, truly is God. See, and a lot of people think, and as a matter of fact, the one that they're arguing about, Nestorius, you know, used the argument that the statement that Mary is the mother of God or the Theotokos yeah. is, means that she must be God. Yeah, right. A lot of people still try to make that argument. That's not the point, is it? No, it's actually interesting in Ephesus, as you know, there's that great temple to, um, to the goddess, you know. Diana. Diana. And so the claim is made sometimes, oh, they just transplanted the ancient, you know, belief in the goddess Diana now to the goddess Mary. No, no, she's the mother of God, and that makes all the difference. She's not a goddess. She's a human being, but she's the mother of the one who is God. Right. And therefore, it's a, it's a Christological claim, a claim about Jesus. And so we made that point in Ephesus that uh, there's an interesting play here. This is the place of Diana. But we're not dealing with a new Diana here. We're not dealing with a new goddess, no. but with the mother of God. Right. But I love that, uh, you're right, the, the film in the ruins of the Basilica there in Ephesus, I found very moving. And to recall that when they made that declaration of Theotokos, the people, the common people, uh, had a torchlight exactly. parade. Exactly. I mean, they rejoiced in this title of Mary. Uh, so the theologians came around to saying it correctly eventually, but the people had that deep sense about Mary. Right. Right. No, it was, it was something where the, the bishops and theologians, yeah. you know, were at one in faith yeah. with the people. Mm -hmm. And that was important. You know, Matt, uh, you, you had uh, uh, some challenges, uh, some cool things happened too. Um, uh, you went up to talk about purgatory in Scotland. Uh, not 
that you think Scotland is purgatorio, do you? It was actually Ireland. It was a, oh, it was in I, Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so in Ireland you went to talk but it's like about Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but you're not saying that Ireland is purgatorio. <laughs> no. No, that would be your point. No, no, sure. no, 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 no. It's I, I've not been to Ireland, but the pictures are lovely. But the um, but you you why did you go to Ireland to talk about purgatory? Well, Father Barron had knew about this island called Loch Derg, which is where uh, pilgrims go to. Um, I don't know how you would put it to just do penance. Yeah, so. to, you know, and and they have for for three days or two or three days they uh, don't wear any shoes, they uh, don't sleep, they fast, and it's meant to be a you know very very challenging uh, uh, two three day uh, event, and um, you know so he was using that to illustrate what purgatory would be like. Uh, when we went to Ireland, it was beautiful weather. I mean, blue skies, brilliant sunshine except for the one day that we were going to shoot at this island, it was miserable. Let's take a look at the clip. We have that ready for us. Loch Derg is a rocky, uninviting island located in the middle of a forgotten lake in Northwest Ireland. To this place, strangely, thousands of people come every year in order to make a penitential spiritual retreat. They are ferried to the island and then told to take off their shoes and socks. They are to remain unshod for the duration of their spiritual exercise. They spend the first day praying the rosary, walking on their knees over punishing beds of stone and attending services. For that day and night, they are not permitted to sleep. If they doze off, attendants rudely awaken them. After two and a half days of practically constant prayer and spiritual exertion, the retreatants are ferried back to the mainland. In the Middle Ages, this island was known as St. Patrick's Purgatory. And popular legend said that the entrance to Purgatory was nearby. We can dispense, of course, with the crude literalism, but we should still pay attention to the association of what took and takes place on Loch Durer and what the church means by purgatory in the supernatural sense. Those who come to the island love God. They wouldn't go through such punishment unless they did. But they recognize imperfections in themselves which need to be corrected so that their relationship to God might be set fully right. And therefore, they willingly go through a crucible. Just as denizens of hell, if there are any, are there freely. So those who pass through purgatory do so because they want to. Once more, this has nothing to do with a supposed cruelty or capriciousness on God's part. It has to do with the sinner's perceived need to deal with the effects of his sin. So that in this case, uh, uh, the weather was cooperating with you to show uh, a little bit of the uh, you know, the, the penitential life that, that, that they live there on Lock Door. Yeah, if it were sunny out, it would look, oh, that looks kind of nice. You know, you're walking in your bare feet. It's, you know, nice, lovely grass, blue sky. I'd like to go there. Right. Um, but it just so happened that the weather, and that's what was amazing about this, this whole yeah. project, is that for two years, we never had a day that was, was no. canceled by weather. Um, everything was perfect. The only really was bad that. day was that one day. The yeah. one day that we needed the weather to be bad, it was it was bad. <laughs> so it was it was it was so, amazing. So one sense what we're saying is that you are really a co-director with God. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Exactly. He's taking care of the weather. Yeah, and you're cue just the doing... rain. Yeah, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't pull that. Couldn't yeah, do that. Really. Uh, also, I noticed that in, in one of the videos that you were at the installation of the Patriarch of Jerusalem. You just happened to be just there? Just by chance. We were in Jerusalem. We were filming at the Church Holy Sepulchre. And then we hear around the bend this banging on the ground. Right, Boom. right, right. Boom. And then we hear this music, kind of like martial music. And uh, Matt's dad, Mike Leonard, you know, who's a Today Show correspondent. And Mike was the executive producer of the show. And that's a great part of the story, too. But Mike said, well, what's going on? And I said, I, I don't know. Well, let's see. And so we waited. And around came this procession. And then I remember that I, I had heard, oh, yeah, the Latin Patriarch is being installed. I said, it must be the installation of the Latin Patriarch. And so we got all that in film. And, and then Mike said, well, tell me now on camera what's going on. So I did a little explanation. We had moments like that where just right. by chance, by wonderful chance, right. these things right. happened. Right. Uh, and that was a, a very interesting scene. Right. 
Right. You know, one of the places that uh, I remember in our conversation uh, yesterday, you were saying you really enjoyed Uganda. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, what was, what was it that you liked so well? I'll never forget it. We went to Namugongo, which is outside of Kampala. And uh, I taught students from Uganda for many years at Mundelein. And I'd ask them, where Mundelein should I? Mundelein is what? It's the seminary outside Chicago. Okay. And it's for Chicago seminarians, but also guys from all over the country and even around the world. I said, where should I go to show African Catholicism? And they all said, Namugongo. I said, where's Namugongo? It's where Charles Lawanga and his companions were killed. So he was the young man, a page to the king of, of Uganda, who refused um, sexual favors and, and then resisted the king's attempt to, you know, uh, force him out of the faith. And he and his companions were marched out to the site, Namugongo, and they were killed there, burned at the stake. And um, now every year, on June the 3rd, the Feast of, of Charles Luanga, 500,000 people come wow. for this festive mass. So we were right there at the heart of it. And this beautiful, you know, exuberant African singing and dancing and so on. Then behind them in stately procession with the red cassock and the surplus, the servers and all the priests and bishops. And a great thing for me, we're there filming. And we were kind of standing out in the sea of, of you know, African faces. There were these white faces and we're filming. So I'd hear... Father Barron is one of my students whom I taught years ago. <laughs> never thought he'd ever see me in Namugongo. What are you doing here? So we caught all that on film. And it's, whenever I talk about it, I'm always moved again. Because anyone watching that scene back in 1886 would have said, that's the end of Catholicism here in, in Uganda. And now, you know, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christians. There you see it. And that place still stays in my mind. Yeah, yeah, because now instead of the blood of the martyrs that was once shed there, you have all of these huge numbers of Christians, and Christianity is growing very rapidly right. in Africa. By leaps and bounds. We tend to look at it, as you know, through the you know, Western lens, and we'll say, oh, the churches are suffering or numbers going down. But then look outside. Look, look to Latin America, to Africa, to Asia, but especially Africa. You're right. This explosion, 140 million uh, Catholics now, I think they're saying 400 million maybe in 50 years. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to look around the world. And I wanted the series to do that to some degree, is to show the wider church. Right, right. No, it's, it's very exciting. And that, you know, you, you show that. What, why were you focusing on those martyrs? Was there, besides wanting to go to Africa? Yeah, well, what, it was. Tell us a little bit about the, 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 the material you do just on martyrdom. Yeah, you know, part of it was the suggestion of the students, as I mentioned, but I wanted in the series always to show individual lives. So we're dealing with ideas and abstractions, you know, incarnation and God and Trinity and so on. But I wanted always to show this looks like something. It shows up in people's lives. So I have a whole episode on saints. I look at four uh, saints. But throughout the series, I wanted lives that embody it. And, of course, the martyrs... Um, it, they correspond in many ways to that great demand of Jesus. How do you stand vis-a-vis -vis Jesus? Right. Are right. you with him or are you against him? And, and they, so, they make the most radical yeah. decision. When push comes to shove, they said, I, I'm with him. Yeah. Even if it means my own death, I'm right. with him. Right. Because of who he claimed to be. If he's one teacher among many, you say, well, yeah, I like his teaching, but if you're going to kill me over him. You know, I'm not right. going to. But if he is who he and says he is. kill me over him. That's right. Not over his teaching. That's right. Over it was just him. his teaching. I mean, you, they could take it or leave it. But right. if you say, no, this is someone who claims to be God, then you have to take a stand. You know, right. and the martyrs did that in the most dramatic way. Right. So I, I, we talk about Edith Stein, for example, right. in the Saints episode, and we filmed in Auschwitz right. where she died. That was a great moment because I knew she had died at Auschwitz. Uh, I didn't know exactly where, though, in the camp. And we had a guide. You have to have a guide when you go into Auschwitz. And um, I said, well, I'd like to film at the end of those tracks, you know, the train tracks that come in and they end so brutally there because people just were taken off the train. He said, oh, no, no, but she wouldn't have come by those tracks. They were 1943. She came in 42. I said, ah, so where did she end up? He said, I'll show you. And he showed me the ruins of the gas chamber where she died, mm -hmm. just the ruins. And then behind it, this open field with kind of a pit in it where the bodies were burned. Right. And so we film right there. Oh, great. And, uh, yeah, extraordinarily moving. And you're right about the martyrs, that they show forth the uh, distinctiveness, really, of this claim. Okay. We have to take a break. Uh, we want to let you know that if you want more information on the series, please go to www.catholicismseries.com.
Catholicism.com. Catholicism series.com. We're going to take our break now. We'll be back in a couple of minutes, and we want to get some of your questions and your comments as well as those of our studio audience. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, first of all, I want to mention that we've got a nice group of folks here from different parts of the country who have come to join us. And we'd love to have you come and be part of our audience and to join us at Mass as well. If you can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2965. That's 205-271. 271-2966. Or you can also go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and you can find out more. They'll help you with where you can stay and scheduling of programs, uh, tours of the network, the masses, and getting up to Hansful to, to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. So come down here and join us. Are you ready for some questions? I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to a call. We have Mark on the line. Hello, Mark. Hey, Father Mitch. Hey, well, how are you? What's up? Uh, pretty good. <laughs> Doing well. Good. What, what can we do for you today? Uh, well, I just wanted to thank uh, both Father Barron and Mr. Leonard for this, uh, for this wonderful series. And uh, I was wondering, um, when the show was, after the show was, uh, was shown on PBS, what was the reaction from, what was the feedback from the average viewing audience about the series? Oh, great question. Yeah, good, thank you for that. Thanks for your nice words. Um, you know, we pitched it to um, WTTW in Chicago, which is the PBS uh, channel, and, uh, and they said they loved it. They would love to show it. And then they syndicated around the country to about 100 other PBS channels. Okay. So we were just delighted with that. It's been playing, as he was suggesting, over the past month. And the feedback so far has been very good. Oh, good. The ratings have been good. Um, very little negativity, a little bit from people saying, you know, why is public television showing a show on Catholicism? But really very little. Most of the feedback's been very positive, uh, and that's around the country. Mm -hmm. It's been in L.A., it's been in um, it's New York next week, of course, Chicago, Miami, uh, all over the country. So I've been delighted with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Are they going to show all ten episodes? No, they decided to take a package of four, okay. uh, which is the usual time slot they deal with. And they said, we'll choose four that we think would have the broadest appeal to okay. you know, a secular audience. And they chose the first episode on Jesus, the third episode on God, mm -hmm. then the episode on Mary, and the one on uh, Peter and Paul. Okay. And so and I was delighted that they chose sure. those four. Sure, sure. Great. Congratulations on that. We have a question from our studio audience. Father, where are you from? I'm from the Diocese of Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and I echo the caller. I congratulate Mr. Leonard and Father Barron for not only having foresight, but being courageous and doing it with a smile. God loves a cheerful giver. I'm wondering, uh, especially in New England, the church really is suffering from crisis in many ways. And there's a lot of hostility, not only directed at us, but us at others. I was wondering, in your professional opinion, is um, the media, newspapers, the internet, TV, are they really anti-Catholic and a source of angst for us? Or is it more a type of indifference where they, we have not won them over? And I was wondering what really is your primary goal for making these wonderful programs? 
Yeah, good. Thank you for all those questions. The primary goal was to evangelize. I, mean, I didn't want to make a sort of you know objective documentary where you get five scholars looking at it. I wanted it to be a, an insider's approach. It was a Catholic insider who wanted to talk about Catholicism and show it, but in, I hope in this lyrical way that would draw people in. So evangelization in the manner of John Paul II and Pope Benedict was the, was the goal. In terms of the media, of course, it's a complicated question, as you well know. Um, I think there is some, yes, anti-Catholicism in the media. Yeah. Um, you can see it in a lot of ways. <coughs> There's a, an animus against religion in general, and you see the rise of the new atheists and so on. But I think Catholicism becomes the, uh, the whipping boy in many ways. It's the, it's the religion that's often you know, picked on. What do you do? Well, I mean, we can enter into a sort of a mano a mano combat with the media, or we can maybe try um, to engage them. You know, and, and I'm trying, I think, with this series to do that, is to say, no, there's something beautiful and rich and substantive about Catholicism. Yes, we have this crisis that we have to deal with, absolutely. But I don't want Catholicism reduced to the uh, sex abuse scandal. There's 2,000 years of art, architecture, theology, the saints, poetry, the liturgy, et cetera. And I want to show that and maybe beguile the media into looking uh, you know, with a less jaundiced eye. Uh, that's been my strategy. Yeah, and I, I think that it's not just the abuse scandal that's been, because well before yeah. that came into yeah. play, there was a strong anti-Catholic uh, strain. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I, I cooperated on a video called Hollywood versus Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a trend that was going on back since the 60s. Yeah. And that yeah. Catholicism was being attacked very strongly. Uh, more, you know, evangelicals are too. You know, they don't yeah. necessarily, they don't like uh, evangelicals either. Yeah. Yeah, Jews less so, but uh, Christians are, are targets, and that stands in contrast to the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, when Song of Bernadette won an Academy Award, yeah. Going, Going My, My Way, Way won an Academy Award, yeah. and Bells of Saint Mary. Yeah. Uh, these were great Catholic movies, and then there were lots of biblical movies. And that changed in the late 60s. And Fulton Sheen, of course, in the 50s, emerging right, as a right, major Right, very much player. so. Yeah, and there's that strain of anti-Catholicism that you see in much of American, both high and popular culture, going back to the early days, which pops up. I think you're right. You can look at trends and say, well, in that period it was less prevalent, but then it comes up. And, you know, part of the uh, JFK and his campaign it, uh, reawakened some of the anti-Catholic. Right. Sentiment. I think now the sex abuse scandal has done that, but you're right. It's it's run as a strain through right. a lot of American history. Um, the idea, I think, is to engage the wider culture and to show forth Catholicism in its splendor and its beauty, opposing the culture when we have to. And there are times when we have to. Yes. There's the culture of death, which does manifest itself. Right. The church has to stand against it. But also the church looks for what the fathers called logoi spermatikoi, right? The seeds of the word the word fully expressed in Jesus, but then there are seeds of the word all over the place in philosophy, in culture, in the arts, and so on. And that's still true today. Right. That's behind a lot of my work with the internet. I do these little YouTube commentaries on books and movies and music and popular culture and high culture. And that's my inspiration is the Logoi Spermatikoi. I'm looking for seeds of the word. So I like that approach to the culture. You have to oppose it sometimes. Other times you engage it. Right. Uh, and I think both are strategies that we've used over the centuries. Right, right. We have another caller. Joan is on the line. Hello, Joan. Hi, Father Pacwa. I'm calling from Yonkers, New York. Great. Um, and what's your question? My, just, uh, my question is to uh, Father Barron was um, what inspired him, inspired him to do the documentary and also um, was it because, um, you know, to, to show our richness in the Catholic Church and, and our fallen awake brothers and sisters? Yeah, there are a lot of things that inspired me, but one of them was this time we're going through. You know, I, my priesthood, I've been a priest for 25 years. I'm ordained in 1986, and the first wave of the sex abuse scandal, at least in Chicago, you know, was early 90s. So, I mean, much of my priesthood has been under the cloud of the sex abuse scandal. And it is the worst crisis in American Catholic Church history, it seems to me, the last 10, 15 years. Well, what have the great saints done in times of crisis? You know, go back to Benedict, go back to... Dominic and Francis and Ignatius, 
um, well, they've come forward with a sort of back to basics evangelicalism to say, what's the church about? You know, so think of a Francis and Dominic returning to the great gospel sources, Ignatius rediscovering the spiritual uh, heart of the matter. So I thought that's a good thing to do now is to say, let's recover what we're fundamentally about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, that was part of the inspiration was to respond to the time that we're going through. Also, I was very interested in reaching out to inactive Catholics. They say the number two religion in America after is, Catholics are ex-Catholics. Right. If you, if you count it, the number two religion would be ex-Catholics. I'm very interested in getting them awakened, reinvigorated, uh, that someone just might see something, they might hear something in the show that would bring them back. Right. That was very much an inspiration too. Right. Matt, how has this, th this goal of the program, how has that affected you in various ways? Well, I was exactly who he's describing when this project started. I was a lapsed Catholic. Uh -huh. um, I was Catholic in name only, uh, grew up that way, but didn't really feel strongly connected to the faith other than it was the faith of my parents and uh, my, you know, my grandparents. But, um, and, and that's, I think, part of the reason that, that we connected is because I, you know, I could provide, a, hopefully, a perspective on, you know, here's what I'm missing or here's what I didn't understand and here's what confuses me. And, uh, but going through, you know, I, I feel so much stronger in my faith now, two years later. Mm -hmm. I mean, it went from my, my first child, honestly, was um, I, we had him baptized, but it was just because I thought we should. You know, that's just what was done in, in my family. You know, by my second child, there was n no question about it. And I think that, it, well, I know that's 100% due to working on the series. And I hope mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it, it's like a testimonial. It worked for me. Hopefully, it, it'll work for uh, sure. many, many, many people. Excellent, excellent. Let's go to another question from our studio. And sir, where are you from? Hello, I'm from uh, Missouri, in the Diocese of Jefferson City, Missouri, yeah. actually from Columbia, Missouri. Okay, and your question? Well, let me say a few thoughts here. I, as a world uh, traveler to, and a convert to Catholicism, uh, seeing the extent of the Catholic Church around the world uh, really was an uh, inspiration to me. And uh, also an uh, interest in history and as a physician, uh, the development of uh, medicine through the uh, Catholic Church. I think, I think you've got the perfect uh, evangelism tool here and I congratulate you and thank you very much for it. And I hope it really gets a widespread uh, uh, showing both here in the States and overseas also. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just address the issue you raise about um, uh, science and medicine in relation to the faith. Because one thing that really bugs me is this constant claim that we're the enemy of science, that faith and science are, are uh, implacable foes. We filmed outside of Tucson at the Vatican right. Observatory, right. way up in the, in the mountains outside of Tucson, is this state-of-the-art uh, observatory. And at that site, I developed Josef Ratzinger's argument for God's existence which is based upon the intelligibility of the world. Every scientist has to assume, and it's a kind of mystical intuition, that the world is intelligible. Psychology wouldn't get off the ground unless the psyche had a logos attached to it. It was intelligible. No astronomer would get off the ground unless he thought that the heavens had some kind of order and structure. And Ratzinger's point is this universal intelligibility speaks to a great intelligence which has thought the world into being. His point there is that at the deepest level, science and faith are, are one, that they, they come together as, as brothers or as sisters, you know, because uh, there's a mystical intuition behind the sciences about this great intelligence that gives rise to intelligibility. And so I, I wanted to make that point as clearly as I could in the series, that faith and reason are not opponents. We're the great both and religion, faith and reason, faith and science. Um, and I wanted that to come through because you hear it all the time today in the popular culture. One of the things that I always loved is Saint uh, or uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, argument that science depends on faith. Yeah, you yeah, science quite right. cannot prove the scientific method. Its own ground. Because yeah. Yeah. to do so, you'd have to do the pr scientific method, yeah. and to prove something by itself is tautology. You, That's right. You you, you break the rules. 
yep. of logic. And so you assume and believe that the scientific method is yeah. true and is well grounded, uh, but you can't prove it. No, and, and you also have to assume that the world you're going to go out to meet is intelligible. Right. That's a mystical intuition. And we say, of course, in the beginning was the word. And all things came to be through the word, which means they're not dumbly there, they're intelligibly there. They're marked by an intelligence. And that's why I would argue with many others that it's no accident that the Western sciences emerged when and where they did, right. namely out of a Christian uh, thought matrix. Because it's this great doctrine of creation which says the world isn't God. Therefore, you don't worship the world. You can experiment on the world. You can analyze it. But more to it, the world is marked in every nook and cranny by intelligibility. Those are both corollaries of the more fundamental doctrine of creation. Right. And that's why this theology stands behind uh, the sciences. Also, how many people know, I find on, on my internet ministry, no one knows this. The formulator of the Big Bang Theory of Cosmic Origins was a priest. Jesuit priest. Yeah, it was a Jesuit priest, Georges Lemaitre. Um, so we found a photograph of him in his Roman collar with the blackboard filled with equations. Another photo of Lemaitre in his collar next to Einstein. He had to convince Einstein that this was right. Einstein was resisting him. How many people know that, <laughs> that a Catholic priest formulated the great theory that everyone holds today of cosmic origins? And he was able to teach Einstein. Yeah, that's so right. That's one of the ironies. Right. The taught Catholic Einstein. priest taught Einstein yes, about yes. the Big Bang Theory. But every day you hear, you know, faith, reason, implacable opponents. Not in the Catholic understanding, right. you know. I wanted that to come through, so we, yeah, that's yeah. why we filmed up in uh, Tucson. Even the father of genetics yeah, was Gregor an Augustinian Mendel. priest. That's right. That's right. You know, in Austria. Yeah. You know, so it's you know, th there's a very important yeah. role of science in ca Catholic life, Quite right. and all of our universities, our high schools, teach science. Uh, just the, well, just the other day, we celebrated Saint Albert the Great, yeah, the right. patron saint of scientists, yeah. who was teaching science at the earliest universities of Europe. That's right. He was the, doing cutting edge science in his day. Now right. we look back now and say, well, you know, primitive here and there. Well, sure, but it was the cutting edge science of his day, and he saw no contradiction between being a Dominican friar and being a scientist. Right. And the line from uh, Albert the Great to Georges Lemaitre is a direct line. Yep. You know. Yep. So that's a, a story that needs to be told, I think, over and over again. Yes, absolutely. Might have to do more documentaries just yeah. on that. No, quite right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we have another caller. Rich is on the line. Hello, Rich. Hi, Father. Where are you from? Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Great. And what's your question? Well, I was wondering, uh, from all the places that Father Barron visited, where did he, and these were wonderful places, where did he most sense the presence of God? Oh, gosh. No, it's a great question. And, you know, I, I'm still unpacking this adventure. I will for the rest of my life, probably. It's one of the great moments of my life, these two years of filming. I sense the presence of God everywhere on every trip. That's true. But probably Jerusalem. I'd never been to the Holy Land before we filmed there. And um, just to be in... I remember the first night we had arrived in Jerusalem, and we got to the hotel, and I'm jet-lagged and all this, but I went down to the Western Wall, you know, and to stand there at this place, you know, this place that Jeremiah, where, where the temple was, uh, that Jesus entered and knew. I mean, it was extraordinarily moving to me. And then to film in Galilee. And you look around those hills, and, and we were there at, at night when you don't see many lights up there in those hills. And you think, boy, this has not been that changed. I mean, Jesus would have seen this scene. Uh, our cameraman took us up, or our sound man, was an Israeli, and he took us up to the northeast corner. This beautiful sight, spot overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And he took the whole thing in in one view. Right. And there, you know, Capernaum and, and uh, of the hills where Jesus preached, and there's the water on which he walked. And so I'll never forget that. I sensed God's presence so powerfully in the Holy Land. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I mean, how can any believer go in that church and not be moved? Right. You know, so that was probably the place that most sang to me. Yeah, no, I, uh, I go back to the Holy Land practically every yeah, year. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's one of the places that I find also very powerful continuing. But, it's, but I also noticed how much liveliness of the faith that you, you, you captured 
in your your footage from Africa. Oh, okay. That must have been very powerful too. Wonderful. Yeah, unforgettable. Yeah. That same trip, you know, we went to Calcutta and then to Uganda. Right. We had to, uh, we were running out of time a little bit. We had to get a lot of filming done. So we, that was an extraordinary trip. I'd never been to uh, Calcutta and uh, never seen a place like Calcutta. And to go into the midst of the city in the worst of its squalor, and there you find the Mother Teresa sisters. And uh, that was as beautiful as Chart. I mean, you see the, the smiles on the faces of those sisters working in the worst possible conditions. And then we flew from there to uh, Uganda. You just saw some scenes there of a, an orphanage north of Kampala that's run by a former student of mine. And he invited us out there to, uh, to film and to visit, you know. Right. So yeah, that trip was, uh, was unforgettable. All right, let's uh, go to another call. I have Lorraine on the line. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm calling from Tampa, Florida, and I just want to say I love your show and I'm really looking forward to this series. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, what's um, your question? I had a couple of, uh, two or three questions. I wondered um, who chose the music, who wrote the script, how was it financed? I think Father Barron said it took two years to film. That was one of my questions. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to know which religious order Father Barron belongs to. I'm the Order of St. Peter. I'm a, Wait, I'm a uh, no, priest. you're I'm not. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm a Dawson priest. I'm a priest of uh, the Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about the, uh, the music. It was done by a fellow named Steve Mullen, who Matt knew. And Steve describes himself as an agnostic. I mean, he's not a believer at all, but very gifted composer and had worked with documentaries and various things. And what we did is we gave him a lot of Catholic uh, tunes and intervals and hymns and so on. And boy, did he learn them. And, he, and, and we went through each episode. And I would say, here's the theme I want to get across. For example, in the first one about Jesus, that he's the conqueror of sin and death, that he conquers the powers, that he reigns as Lord. And so the Christus Vincit, that wonderful old, right, right. that becomes one of the light motifs of the whole series. But Steve took in these Catholic uh, hymn tunes and so on, and he wove them into a very creative and very contemporary score. And a lot of people who watch the show, they're struck first by the music. Right. And we went through a lot of ups and downs because we're trying to get the right you know, feel and the music is so important. But I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of what Steve accomplished there. Uh, and I, he just did a wonderful job. Yeah, you, can, you hear the strains of any crowd of spiritus yeah, and all right, that uh, right. so, we, coming through. We gave him all those uh, tunes and suggested where they would belong thematically in the show. And he did a wonderful job. The financing, you know, was all done from um, private donors. It was Catholics in the pews. We began in Chicago, but then went to New York. We went to Boston. We went to San Francisco, Omaha. And um, I was a, a little Franciscan begging for money. You know, I just begged money for about two or three years. The economy collapsed halfway through our fundraising. So that was a challenge. But we raised money and then we filmed as it came in. When we got the requisite money for a trip, I said, let's go. Right. And is it a one part series, five part series? Let's keep going until we finish. And eventually we raised the requisite money. So that was a kind of a miracle of grace and sure. people's generosity. Sure, sure. And uh, anything to add to that, Matt? Uh, just that it was, uh, yeah, I think as you said, it was a two, two and a half year process. Um, we would, sh we shot out of order. So it, with the exception of the first episode, we sort of, you know, did all that at once. But then after that, we were, you know, we would go to one place and shoot this right. scene from six right. and this scene from nine and this scene from three. And then I'd go back and sort of put those little, those little small puzzle pieces together. But there'd be a lot of big black holes in the episode. And so, uh, that was a little bit of a challenge because it wasn't a linear process. It was more like just grabbing these elements, you know, sure. when we could get them. Sure. Yeah, you know, that's, it's, that's one of the challenges of doing this. I want to be able to give people some more information on how you can see the Catholicism series on EWTN. Uh, we're going to be broadcasting here, and you can go to www.ewtn.com and learn more about when we're going to show it. And we want you to stay tuned to EWTN tonight. Because immediately after this show, we will bring you a special presentation of the first episode of the Catholicism series. It's entitled The Fire of His Love, Prayer and the Life of the Spirit, where Father Barron goes on location to where the great saints and spiritual masters lived to explore Catholic spirituality and different types of prayer, including contemplation, adoration, petition, and intercession. And after that, 
at 10 p.m. Eastern Time tonight, you can see part two of the Catholicism series in which Father Barron goes to Poland, Germany, Spain, and New York City to illuminate the teachings of Jesus. Go to www.ewtn.com to find out how you can see the Catholicism series right here on EWTN beginning tonight all the way through Saturday, November 19th, only on EWTN. We're going to show those. Well, you know, we've run out of time. Went fast. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much for being with us. And if you join me in giving a blessing, may Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And again, we can bring you Father Barron tonight and the programs that he's going to be giving us to show because you bring this network to you. You make it possible. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. God bless you.